uh, authentic and dark one that are really related to each other. And uh, he does descriptive work on those languages, uh, mm -hmm. refer reference grammars, uh, has also prepared an aesthetic national corpus, which is online and very impressive piece of work. Um, and also has a Dovos uh, funded project on the documentation of that one. Uh, so that's in terms of language documentation, but he also does a lot of uh, work on language theories on the day, by LFG, as we can see today. And uh, his sort of theoretical interests are syntax and semantics of complex constructions, such as subordination and coordination rather than process. And that's, that's what we're going to hear today. Thank you for this introduction. I'm happy to be speaking here and the talk today will be about limiting the domains of coordination and subordination, trying to provide formal definitions for both concepts which would capture the variation of constructions that we encounter in languages of the world and the mismatches that occur in uh, uh, cases where we can't really classify the constructions as clearly subordinating or clearly coordinating. So uh, the notions of coordination and subordination. So traditionally, they are defined as a binary distinction between two types of clause, a linkage, uh, and also, of course, uh, linking in other areas of grammar, such as the subordination of a noun, phrase, to verb. But mostly, these concepts, uh, in what we shall discuss, will mostly we will mostly uh, talk about clause coordination, subordination. So subordination is a construction traditionally believed that it's a construction where the subordinate clause is located in, con in constituent uh, structure terms with within the main clause and is dependent on it in some way either using uh, because it, it contains an overt subordination marker such as in this case or if it's a non-finite clause uh, such as with the uh, participles, converbs and infinitives and coordination is traditionally understood as a construction where we have two or more clauses which have identical status with respect to each other none, none, none of them is embedded within the other but rather they all form a constituent uh, with possibly a mm, conjunction which uh, does, not, uh, does not belong to any of the conjuncts but stands sort of in between them or is attached to each of them symmetrically or is attached to one of them but importantly it is not uh, located within this conjunct in the structural sense. It does not mark dependency in any way. And so uh, this means that this generally this uh, concept is an amalgamation of several uh, ideas which is based on a general and vague somewhat vague concept of symmetry versus asymmetry. And a good example, for example, of the traditional approach is uh, Crystal's definition in his uh, Addiction of Linguistic Terms, where he says that subordination is a term used in grammatical analysis to refer to the process or result of linking linguistic units so that they have different syntactic status, one being dependent upon the other and usually constituent of the other. So he says it's distinguished from coordinate linkage in that in coordinate linkage they're equivalent. But of course, uh, in traditional grammar, such terms as being equivalent or being dependent are not strictly defined. But in most cases, it is uh, quite clear what we are talking about. So we have clauses which have some sort of dependency, some clauses which don't have this dependency. And I should mention that one of the first attempts to provide clear criteria to, to determine, uh, to choose between subordination and coordination is the classic work by Peshkovsky on uh, Russian syntax. But generally, before the second half of the 20th century, there have been more or less an assumption that these notions are basic and do not need to be discussed in any way. But why do we need uh, to discuss this and why do problems arise? There are several constructions even in uh, well-known languages such as English which challenge the traditional binary distinction between the two clauses. So the first construction is so-called left subordinating and uh, known uh, from mm, the works by Kurikov and Jekindov on uh, on, the, on, on, on this construction. So this, in this construction, one example of which is found in one. Uh, so this is, uh, you, drink, you drink one more can of beer and I'm leaving. It, has a, it uses the coordinating conjunction and, but with a meaning that is conditional. So in this sense, it can be analyzed as being equivalent to a subordinating construction with the uh, subordinator if. So if you, if you drink one more can of beer, I'm leaving. So in this sense, the consumption is not symmetrical. One of the clauses is clearly dependent on the other in the sense of being its condition. A second example is so-called pseudo-coordination when a conjunction like and is used for, uh, for linking a complement clause generally to a main clause. Uh, 
like in, tri in the try end construction in English, try and disprove my point. So essentially, disprove is a complement clause dependent on the verb try, even though the marker of close language is the traditionally uh, is the conjunction and traditionally stood as being coordinate. A third example is so-called commutative, commutative coordination in languages like Russian and other Slavic languages and also Yiddish, uh, where a uh, preposition with is used in the sense, uh, in the same sense, generally in the same sense as uh, a conjunction which links to coordinate noun phrases. So, for example, in three from Russian, ко мне пришли Петя с Васей means Петя and Васей came to me, and th this uh, verb agreement is plural, which uh, means that they denote a plural entity, but the noun phrase itself clearly has a head in terms of case marking because Peter is nominative, which corresponds to the subject position, whereas Vaisa is in the instrumental case, which is subcategorized for by the preposition with. So in the sense, at least, of syntactic dependency, this construction is subordinating. Peter with Vaisa, with Vaisa being in an uh, oblique case. But in the terms of semantics, in terms of dependence of the verb on the, mm, in, te in terms of verb agreement, this construction looks like uh, just like traditional coordination. And then we have in many languages converb constructions where a form which is morphologically dependent, which contains, uh, which lacks certain finite categories such as agreement morphemes or certain tense and aspect morphemes uh, functions in the very same way as we find uh, with uh, coordinating constructions in uh, more well-known, in more familiar languages, such as four from Shiri uh, Dargwa. I finished my walk and Ali came, just a normal sequence of clauses, but the only way to express this meaning in Shiri uh, is to use a converb clause uh, for the first conjunct of this construction. So literally it means something like me having done the work, Ali came to me, whereas uh, formally the form is dependent, but semantically it is indistinguishable from what we call coordination in more familiar languages. So how can we define these uh, constructions and how can we say, okay, so uh, how can we uh, say that uh, this and that construction belongs more to coordination, more to subordination? Can we uh, come up with, a criteria, with criteria which can help us distinguish them? And of course the basic idea that, uh, that comes up, especially when we are talking about one single language, is that we can just look at how canonical constructions behave, constructions about which we clearly know that they're coordinating and subordinating, and then try to see whether other constructions which are, whose status is not as clear uh, feel, uh, fall into one of the groups or the other group. And the tests which have been proposed in the literature are, for example, uh, in 5 and 6, uh, constituency test, tests on linear order, and 5 6 illustrates central embeddings, so generally, if a language generally allows embedding one clause into the other, it is the subordinate clause which can be embedded and coordinate clauses cannot. So five is uh, an example from Coca uh, with a central embedding of a uh, adverbial clause in English. So such techniques when coupled with a suitable interface could provide a VI person with a feedback mechanism. Now in six, we try to do something similar with a coordinate construction and this fails in any possible configuration because conjuncts of coordinate constructions cannot be embedded one into the other. Another mm, constraint which uh, is well known since Ross's uh, dissertation on constraints and variables in syntax is the coordinate structure constraint and in the general formulation it is stated that you, cannot ex you can only extract elements, uh, you cannot extract elements from just one of mm, two of several coordinate uh, conjunctions of a coordinate structures. So in 7 we see that we can extract uh, the uh, direct object from the main clause in the presence of an adverbial clause uh, a when clause. So who did Ali see when Russell came? But we cannot do the same thing if you use a coordinating construction. So we cannot say who did Ali see and Russell came because in this case uh, we have a coordination and uh, the interrogative is extracted only from one of the two clauses. And uh, in pair with the coordinate structure constraint came its uh, inverse side, the uh, possibility of across the board extraction and unlike extraction from single uh, clauses which is allowed with subordination is not allowed with coordination, this works the other way. So with coordinate constructions we can extract the same element from both of the two clauses and with uh, subordinating constructions we can't do that. So 9 illustrates that we can uh, extract who, in this case, from both, uh, is a direct object from both clauses, who did Ali see and Russell here, but we cannot do this uh, when we have an adverbial clause, uh, and we can't extract the conjunct from both clauses, both the main and the adverbial clause. So 
who did Alicia when Russell heard is, as far as I know, ungrammatical in English. Finally, another test which I would like to uh, point out is the possibility of uh, cataphora. So when, when uh, generally when in the coordinate structure, uh, only anaphoric relations between the two clauses are allowed, meaning that the uh, antecedent must precede the pronominal which refers to it. But in, in uh, subordination, if the subordinate clause precedes the main clause, uh, the uh, pronoun can stand before its antecedent. So in 11, when he arrived, Ali went to Rasul, can be interpreted as he being coreferent with Ali, but 12, uh, does not have the same interpretation, he arrived and Ali went to Rasul, generally cannot mean that he equals Ali. So there's a lot of these tests and they work in, in a particular language, they work rather well to delimit the domains of two uh, constructions, coordinations and subordinations, and, and then we, we can try to think about what the rest of the unclear field between them falls into. And one of the well-known proposals about this is for invariance. Uh, idea that we can have a third notion between coordination and subordination, which they call, aptly enough, core subordination. So we sort of have something in between coordination and subordination, and they cast this uh, idea into an opposition between two features, dependency and embedding. So a coordinate construction is neither dependent nor embedded, a subordinating construction is both dependent and embedded, whereas core subordination in their approach is dependent but not embedded. So it's sort of a detached uh, subordinate clause, as it were. And uh, the main criterion that they use in their mm, work is a uh, scope of uh, executionary operators. So in 13 from Amele, uh, from language Amele, uh, the uh, the, there is a question marker four at the end of the sentence, uh, which takes scope, which must obligatorily take scope over both clauses. So uh, pig having run out, man kill them question even though pig run out is uh, uh, marked as subordinating. The question scopes over both clauses, so the sentence means did the pig run out and did the man kill it? So it doesn't mean did the man kill the pig when it ran out, for example, which would happen if it were a subordinating construction. So the question operator scopes over both clauses and does not distinguish between uh, whether one of them is dependent or uh, main clause. And in their approach, coordination has optional wide scope, whereas subordination has only narrow scope on the main clause. So that's the difference between the two constructions according to Foley and Van Velen. So this works out well for the languages in question, but uh, the idea is that the same tests, at least more or less, should apply across languages and should generally uh, yield uh, the same results across languages. So we should find the same three classes in all languages and we should find that these classes generally uh, behave in the same way according to the, uh, uh, according to the same tests. And this, unfortunately, is not as good, uh, as well uh, uh, fulfilled as uh, we might think. And uh, Balthazar Bickel, in his 2010 uh, paper, has tried to uh, apply the generally the test on coordination subordination that are used in the literature to a, to a test sample of 24 languages uh, to try and find whether there is any prototype, uh, there is any cluster of tests that would delimit uh, any kind of uh, close linkage types. And it turns out that he did find evidence for a certain prototype of subordination, as he says, but there is no evidence for a uh, cross-linguistically stable and consistent set of tests which would delimit coordination or co-subordination. So essentially it means that only one notion of the three notions proposed by Foley and Van Veren makes any sense cross-linguistically, whereas the notion co-subordination essentially is some sort of a, uh, just a common, gro uh, just a dumping uh, area for anything that doesn't fit into our preconceived standards for either subordination or coordination as we generally understand it from uh, European languages. But maybe it's not the uh, distinction itself but the method of defining the notions via test that is flawed. So there's nice approach which takes a more lenient stance. This is approach by Christian Lem Lemon which says essentially that there's a continuum between coordination and subordination. It's based on several scales, which mark the sep different degrees of dependency uh, of cer certain clauses on the others. Uh, and so generally it is assumed that some constructions fall into one of the sides of all of these scales. So there are certain constructions which are dependent according to both morphological dependency and uh, syntactic and the possibility of embedding and other constructions which are not dependent and not embedded and so on. But the problem with this approach is that the same criticism applied to it. Uh, that is that there is no fixed set of tests and no clear procedure for situating a given construction in 
each of the scales. There's a general understanding that there is a client from one type of closed juncture to the other, but there is no particular procedure that we can apply systematically and determine whether a construction is here or there in the continuum. So, so in general, this is uh, at best uh, a this is at best a general idea to, uh, that can lead us to getting new facts, but this does not really predict anything. And essentially it implies the rejection of a cross-linguistic distinction between coordination and subordination. So it implies that languages can vary in uh, unlimited terms with respect to these things, and they just uh, cannot uh, possibly... Uh, we, we cannot say that uh, there are any limits on this variation. So maybe we should abandon, abandon the notions of coordination and subordination at all. They are maybe just uh, traditional I, notions which do not have any place in the modern theory of grammar. This is what, in fact, Hyman and Thompson uh, have proposed and many other linguists follow their track, especially those working on the functional paradigm uh, frameworks. So, for example, this quote shows that um, subordination is not a grammatical category at all. This is simply a concept which we, uh, uh, in which we rationalize how uh, Western educated intuitions which renders it completely circular. So we first define certain things in our languages based on some sort of tests and then we try to find the same things in other languages but there is no there is no particular um, reason to believe that these notions that we find in our languages will automatically transfer to other languages. But the problem with this idea that we should abandon the notions like with any other kind of th this kind of radical proposal to abandon everything is that time and again across languages we find that similar uh, clusterizations of constructions in, in, in the general sense. So we don't have the same test giving the same results, but we do find the tendency for uh, so, so coordinating like meanings to be expressed by more symmetrical con con constructions to have more symmetrical properties, whereas subordination like uh, ideas are expressed by more embedded and dependent constructions which have more subordination like properties. So uh, if we want to abandon these notions as Heyman and Thompson proposed, we would have to propose something else except for these notions and simply abandoning them and saying that there is unlimited variation would uh, be a step back because in this case we would just throw away all the uh, data that has been gathered in work on this uh, issue. So what I think is a more promising approach and in fact what the approach that I will develop, uh, attempt to develop in this talk is the multi-level approach to coordination and subordination which has been proposed uh, in two seminal papers. One of them is by Kurikov and Jekendorf, 1997 dedicated to left subordinating and in English, which we just had an illustration of, and uh, U.S. and 2002, which is dedicated to several other constructions uh, in languages of the world. And the idea of these two papers is that uh, the notions of coordination and subordination remain binary, but they can be defined separately for two levels of language, syntax and semantics. So we can have sy syntactic coordination and subordination, semantic coordination and subordination. They can coincide, they usually coincide, but sometimes they don't, and sometimes we can have mismatches and Kurikov and Jekindorf discuss a mismatch uh, where a construction is syntactically coordinating but semantically subordinating, whereas U.S. and Sadek describe a separate kinds of mismatches where a construction is not syntactically subordinating and semantically coordinating. And crucially, the different tests apply at different levels. So we have a set of tests uh, which uh, distinguishes syntactic coordination and subordination, a set of tests which distinguishes um, semantic coordination and subordination. And even though there can be com conflicts between these two groups of tests, there can be no conflicts within one and the same group of tests. And so why do they argue that there should be distinction between syntax and semantics? Now, Kurikov and Jekindorf, based on English left subordinating and, show some properties which it does not share with normal uh, English coordinating ends of. For example, there is no possibility of right note raising. So while you can have something like uh, Big Louie found out about and Big Louie put out a contact on, uh, the guy who stole some loot from the gang, you can't do this in a conditional meaning. So you can't say something like Big Louie finds out about and Big Louie uh, puts out a con contact on the guy who stole some loot from the gang. This is impossible if you want to have a conditional reading of this construction. The second effect that they use is uh, the impossibility of gapping. So you cannot gap the verb in a, a sentence like Big Louie steals one more care radio and Little Louie the hubcaps. Uh, you can do this in a normal coordinating reading, but you can't do this in a conditional reading. Then there is the possibility of, of binding a reflexive in the first cl clause from the, main, from the second clause. So another picture of himself appears in the newspaper. As Susan thinks John will definitely go out and get a lawyer. Finally, there is no across-the-board extraction from left subordinating end. So you can say this is the thief who uh, you just point out and we arrest on the spot. In the sense that y y if you point him out, we arrest him on the spot. So 
from these tests, we can be led to believe that that left subordinating end is simply a subordinating conjunction, which just happens to be homonymous with a corresponding coordinating conjunction. But the problem is that it is quite exceptional for English subordinating conjunctions if it were one of them. Because first of all, it has an exceptional position following the subordinate clause rather than preceding it. It is the only of its kind in English, if we would assume so. And uh, it doesn't allow, we, we are not allowed to reverse the order of the clauses and to postpose uh, the first clause after the second. We cannot say, uh, even though with normal conditional clauses we can postpose the if clause after the main clause in uh, left subordinating and we cannot do that. And their uh, solution is to say that this construction essentially has coordinating syntax, which explains the last two properties, but subordinating semantics, and according to Kulikov and Jekendorf, all of these four tests and some other tests that they use are all dependent on the semantics. Now, Joas and Sedek have a separate kind of constructions, and one of the examples of the constructions they look at is uh, a Japanese te, uh, te subordination or coordination, that's uh, close chaining. Uh, so, Maki went to Osaka yesterday, and uh, Hiro will return from Kyoto tomorrow. And in this sentence, the first clause is headed by a converbal form, itte, and the main clause is headed by a finite form in u, iku. And so, according to Joas and Sedek, uh, this is the fact that this, the, the first form is uh, non-finite, it cannot be used in an independent sentence. Uh, it, it means that it is uh, dependent on the main clause, subordinate in the syntactic sense, but it is coordinating, according to them, because it has uh, no coordinate structure, it does not obey the coordinate structure constraint, it, uh, it, allows, it does not allow catapora, and uh, it uh, is not found in presupposition, which according to Yasin Sedek is a characteristic feature of uh, subordination. So they say that this construction is, uh, on, on the contrary, semantically coordinating, but syntactically subordinating. And so what we are synthetic proposed is a general typology of uh, the construction that we find in languages of the world according to these two uh, distinctions. So we have coordination and subordination, which clearly align syntax and semantics. And we have pseudo-coordination, which is a construction which has coordinating syntax but subordinating semantics. And we have pseudo-subordination, which has subordinating syntax but coordinating semantics. Now what will I do here is first of all to attempt uh, uh, to apply the multi approach to aesthetic pseudo-coordination, uh, which is a general uh, repeating of my recent uh, paper in Journal of Linguistics, where, where I have this in more detail. Then I will demonstrate that we need three levels instead of two uh, if we want to use the multi-level approach. And I will also demonstrate that what Kulikov and Jekindov and USA say they call semantics is actually a syntactic level of representation and I will formulate the findings of LFG and finally show how uh, the uh, same approach allows generalizing some facts, uh, similar facts in uh, Russian. So first some general info on aesthetic. Here you have uh, a map of the region where it's spoken in yellow and it is spoken in the uh, North Caucasus mostly in North Ossetia, in the center of the North Caucasus, between the Black and the Caspian Seas. In, in the West, it is bordered by uh, West Caucasian and Turkic languages. In the East, it's bordered by East Caucasian, North Dagestanian languages, Chechen and Ingush. And finally, to the South, it is bordered by uh, South Caucasian languages like Georgian. So it has a very peculiar position, but uh, um, uh, genetically, it is not uh, part of the same linguistic area. It is an Iranian language. Uh, which ultimately distends from a group of uh, from a skito sarmatian tribe, the Alans, which, were, which moved to the Caucasian, uh, to the border of the Caucasian mountains in the first centuries AD, and stayed there and mostly had contact with the local populations, which uh, has determined, which has led to the, f to the substantial differences between the grammar of ascetic and the grammars of other uh, modern Iranian languages which can have different explanations. Sometimes it is explained by language context, sometimes simply by divergent development, but in general, this language is quite unusual for the Iranian group. So it's, it has around half a million speakers. It's an SOV language with completely accusative alignment, something which is not typical for this area, which has mostly at least some traces of ergativity in the languages. And it has an inflectional verb morphology and agglutinating, mostly innovative noun morphology. Now let's first take a look at the general way in which subordination is and coordination are carried out in aesthetic. So there are, uh, for subordination, the main uh, strategy is to use uh, correlatives. So sentences like 19, when I heard your voice, I became happy. 
which literally reads uh, like something like uh, when I heard your voice, then I became happy. So the subordinate clause is found at the left periphery of the main clause, contains an uh, invert subordinator, and is obligatorily resumed in the main clause by a demonstrative element which uh, anaphorically, um, is anaphorically connected to the subordinate clause. And this uh, pattern is used for not only adverbial clauses, but also for relative clauses. So, which uh, boy I saw, he is my friend, is the way of forming relative clauses in aesthetic, and also even for complement clauses, which are formed in ways like, uh, I know that you came, that I know. So the second that is a demonstrative. So this is the main way of forming subordinate clauses in aesthetic. And as for coordination, aesthetic utilizes the standard uh, average European, as it were, uh, way of uh, forming mm, coordinate clauses. This is simply using a conjunction between, standing between the two uh, clauses, like in 12, so, uh, in 20, sorry. Uh, I was, I'm staggering like a drunkard, but I'm going to you, so here, uh, from the aesthetic national corpus, so, uh, like a drunk man, uh, I'm staggering, but to thee, I'm going. Now the conjunction that will be in focus of our investigation today is the conjunction and, ama, and on this slide you can see that in general it is used as a purely uh, uh, standard and typical coordinating conjunction. So it can combine n piece with each other like in 21, Alan's sister and Zaur's wife came to me. It can combine adjective or adjective phrases like in 22, uh, my good and uh, beautiful wife like in 22. Finally, you can combine a whole uh, sentence, whole clauses, like in 23, Aksarta cut off the head of the giant and entered the yard of the Donbetters. It is a fragment of the Nart epics, and mythical characters. And in all these cases, you have a complete symmetry between the two um, conjuncts, and you have the conjunction staying right between each of them. And historically, too, the conjunction goes back to uh, proto Iranian Hama. It is, con it is a cognate to Persian Ham, so it's a purely it means also in Persian and probably meant also in the Proto language. So, uh, in its origin, this is also a purely standard coordinating conjunction with nothing suspicious about it. But, un but unfortunately, <laughs> or maybe fortunately, it's used also in some case, uh, uses which is, are not as typical for coordination as we might think, which I call through the coordination following Yuas and Sadek, uh, due to the fact that they s at least seem to have subordinating semantics in spite of having coordinate syntax. So 24 illustrates a construction which I call causal through the coordination. And in this construction, uh, the combination of the dative form of the distal demonstrative pronoun women, literally to that, and the conjunction and uh, with the following clause implies a causal meaning. So the sentence uh, in 24, I do not allow you to go to work because you are ill, literally means something like I do not allow you to go to work for that and you are ill. So here, uh, the causal meaning arises from the combination of the dative form of the demonstrative and the uh, conjunction and. The second construction which I will be looking at is so-called complement to the coordination where the conjunction and is used to introduce a complement clause, like in 25. Uh, do you think that we will part ways like this? This is the translation. And literally the sentence means, do you think and we will part ways like this? So this is somewhat similar to English try and, with the difference that here you combine not just heads but whole uh, clauses with their own subjects in, and, and their own uh, structure. And importantly, in the causal construction, the pronominal element, the dative element, is not uh, part of the same word as the construction, but it can float freely uh, uh, in the main clause, and essentially it uh, categorically refers to the second clause. So, for example, 26, if you wanted to focus uh, the, subordinate, uh, the semantically subordinating clause, we would put the pronominal element into the preverbal position, but the conjunction will stay between the two clauses. So it is because I cannot forgive that I've reached this state. This is an example 26, and literally it means um, I have reached this state to that, uh, uh, I, uh, I, these places to that have reached, and I don't know how to forgive. So here, uh, to focus the subordinate clause, we just move the, the dative form of the pronoun into the focus position pre-verbally, but the, con the conjunction stays in the same place. So the marker of clause linkage in the purely linear and structural sense is and, it's not the dative pronoun. And now let's take a look at the properties of these constructions and try to determine whether they are coordinating or subordinating. The first test that I will look at is embedding. So embedding for in, in aesthetic for canonical subordination and coordination gives the expected results. So canonical subordinate clauses can be, uh, that is correlatives, can be embedded if the subordinate clause precedes the correlate, like in 27, Zaur, 
uh, that he was hungry because of that, ate a whole fat chin, so here the subordinate clause is inside uh, the main clause. And 28 illustrates that you cannot do the same thing with coordinate clauses, uh, just like we saw recently, uh, just for English. And according to this criterion, both of the pseudo-coordinating constructions are coordinating, meaning that under no circumstances can the subordinate, the semantic uh, subordinate or secondary clause be embedded within the main clause, as shown in 29 and 30. The second criterion, again in relation to linear order, is the position of the conjunction. So generally, uh, we can expect that coordinate clauses have the conjunction between the two uh, clauses, whereas subordinating clauses have the conjunction inside one of these clauses. And the city gets this perfectly well uh, seen, even better than in English, because of the fact that most subordinating conjunctions in ascetic are preverbal, like in 31. So here, mm, the sentence means, I know that Zaur has done it. Uh, I'm, uh, sorry, no, uh, yeah, I know that Zaur is a liar. Uh, and as you see, the subordinating, subordinator K can only be located before uh, the verb of the subordinate clause. It cannot be clause initial, it cannot be in the second position, only preverbal. So we can clearly see that it is, at least in surface terms, clause internal. And there's a smaller subclass of subordinators which, can, uh, which have a freer position, but still they're characterized by the fact that they can appear in any linear position within the subordinate clause, starting from the beginning of the clause and ending in the preverbal position. So again, generally we can put the subordinator within the subordinate clause. And for and, this is not possible, so we have to split it between the clauses. I called Zaur and he came here. The conjunction and has to stand after Zaur and before that he it cannot move farther to the right or to the left, in fact. And as far as this test is concerned, again, we see that and in both of the pseudo-coordinating constructions behaves just like a coordinating conjunction should. So it cannot be embedded in any possible way, as you see in 34 and 35. So Sao thinks Alan, him, and cheats is impossible, and the same concerns the causal construction in 35. The final test, which is related to linear order, is the fact that generally uh, in uh, uh, coordination, uh, in subordination you can coordinate two clauses containing the subordinating conjunction. So I know that uh, you came and that you repent. So you have two that clauses coordinated. Whereas with um, coordinating conjunctions you can't do the same thing, so you cannot say uh, Zao came, but he didn't prepare for the lesson, and but he uh, was ill, for example. So uh, this is the contrast between coordination and subordination, which is also uh, true for ascetic, as shown in 36 and 37. So I know that Zaur has done it, but that he repents is perfectly fine, but the sun is shining, but it is cold, and but I don't want, to, don't want to go for a walk is bad. And according to this criterion, again, the two constructions are uh, coordinating. So you cannot coordinate to uh, clauses beginning with this uh, end. Now let's take a look at more abstract features and here we finally find certain mismatches between the two uh, constructions and, uh, and uh, coordination. So in 40 we see that in the co canonically coordinating construction if, we if some external construction such as a conditional clause assigns mood features to uh, the uh, co sequence of coordinate clauses uh, the mood feature must be assigned to both of them. You cannot assign it to the first conjunct and uh, omit it from the second conjunct. So in 40, in 40 uh, we have if you come home and go to sleep, you will pass your exam well tomorrow. And both come home and go to sleep have to be in the subjunctive. It, it cannot be the case that the first clause in the subjunctive and in the second clause in, is in the, in the future. Both can be in the future or both can be in the subjunctive. So this has to be uh, the same feature across the coordinate structure. In 41, we see that in the subordinating construction, uh, on the contrary, uh, there is no such uh, requirement. Uh, so if you find out that he has arrived, tell it to me. So here only the verb no uh, carries the subjunctive feature, whereas the complement clause has simple past tense. And according to this tense, causal pseudo-coordination is uh, coordinating, meaning that both clauses must carry the same uh, uh, mood feature. So if you take wife because she has money, you will not be happy. So he if has to assign the subjunctive uh, mood to both clauses. You cannot ha use a uh, present tense or the future tense in the mm, second clause if the first clause has subjunctive. Whereas in complement to the coordination, uh, the assignment of mood features to the subordinate clause is perfectly uh, independent from what is assigned by, the, by if. Uh, another test is, uh, that also is related to uh, the uh, distribution of features across clauses 
is uh, canonical uh, subordination. So, unfortunately, we cannot directly test the coordinate structure constraint in a setting because there are very few non-local dependency constructions. So, essentially, double H movement in a setting only occurs locally within the same clause. So, we cannot, for example, extract uh, a double H word from within the complement clause into the main clause. So, we cannot apply the test directly, but we can uh, do some other things, and in particular, one of the things which is very similar to what, how the coordinate structure constraint is generally tested is uh, the fact that when we have uh, a sequence of two correlative clauses which correspond to the same correlative pronoun in the main clause, both of them have to contain uh, a correlative pronoun, uh, sorry, a subordinator if they are coordinate. So 44 uh, shows that this is not the case for subordination. When I found out what Zaur has done, I stopped talking to him literally. What Zaur has done, when I found this out, then uh, I stopped talking to him. So when only has to be found in the main clause, not in the subordinate clause. Whereas in coordination, you have to put uh, the mm, subordinator in both clauses. So I know that Alan came home and went to sleep. You have to repeat that. You have to say Alan home that came and then went to sleep, that went to sleep, that I know. But you cannot use this conjunction in just one of the clauses. And according to this criterion, again, we see that complement to the coordination beha be behaves just like uh, a, a subordinating construction, meaning that the conjunction has only has to be present in the semantic main clause, the primary clause, whereas causal pseudo-coordination requires it to be present, uh, in, it cannot be present in only the main clause. Another test, uh, a final test on uh, this, uh, in this part of the talk, is right dislocation. So aesthetic has a productive right dislocation construction where uh, a pronominal and critic in the, main, in the clause uh, it resumes a uh, uh, an NP marked by the same uh, corresponding case uh, at the right edge of the clause. So, for example, 48, I saw him, uh, Zaur. So, him is an enclitic and Zaur is a full noun phrase to the right of the main clause. And generally, it is the case that this um, dislocated element has to be related to uh, the clause that lies exactly to its left. So, in a subordinating construction, it's possible to interrupt uh, the main clause and the, uh, the, and the main noun phrase which corresponds to the clitic by a subordinate clause. Because technically, uh, the right dislocated element still is a neighbor of the main clause because the supporting clause is embedded within it. So he strongly wants you to come, Zaur. Here, the verb to want subcategorizes for genitive case of the experiencer. And as you see, the clitic is found in the main clause, Zaur is found after the subordinate clause, and Zaur uh, is uh, referenced by that, uh, by the uh, clitic. But it cannot be uh, uh, such a construction is not possible in coordinating constructions like in 50. I saw him, but he told me nothing. Zaur. Here, Zaur cannot cross the boundary of a coordinating construction. It cannot uh, enter the first conjunct by bypassing the second conjunct, which is also a test which is a consequence of the coordinate structure constraint. Now, uh, as far as uh, subordinate pseudo-coordination and subordinate uh, is concerned, again, we find that complement pseudo-coordination behaves like a subordinating construction, so we can do this kind of jumping over the second clause, whereas we cannot do this jumping over in 52 in causal pseudo-coordination. Now the table here on the slides summarizes what we know so far. And for the complement construction, the results fit rather well into the two-level approach. So we see that we have uh, two sets of tests, uh, three tests, uh, three criteria which are related to linear order, and three criteria which are related to various uh, distributive phenomena, generally uh, which can generally be mm, related to the coordinate structure constraint. And we see that canonical constructions uh, pattern rather consistently, while the complement pseudo-coordinating construction has uh, coordinating linear order properties, but subordinating uh, scope and uh, extraction properties, which corresponds rather well to what Kurikov and Jekidov described for English. But the causal construction, the results are somewhat surprising because it turns out to be both uh, semantically and syntactically coordinating, something which we do not expect, of course, in general. And isn't this a strange result for causal meaning, no? Generally, we can say yes, but fortunately, there have been certain attempts to show that certain languages actually do have uh, two types of causal clauses, one of which is closer to coordination. And a good example is German then. Uh, so some of you may know that German has two main uh, causal constructions, while and then, and they're distinguished in terms of word order in the subordinate clause. So then has uh, uh, main clause, word order, uh, verb second, whereas while has subordinate clause, word order, verb final. And this also corresponds, according to a recent book by Scheffler, to their scope properties. Namely, 
uh, only while clauses can surface answers to questions that can be in the focus of a question, uh, whereas then clauses cannot be in the scope of any semantic operators such as focus. So 53, uh, why did the cat jump? Because it saw a mouse, because can only be while the subordinating clause and not then. And similarly, uh, in scope of a question, we can only find while and not then in German. And her solution is to say that basically is to use uh, Chris Potts' distinction between conventional implicature and at issue content. So we have uh, certain kinds of information in the clause, which is at issue, meaning that it is uh, part of the truth conditions, which can be negated, which can be asserted. And there is an additional level of information which is not directly asserted, which is only implied, which is cancelable. And this is conventional implicature. And then introduces a conventional implicature, whereas while introduces an at issue entailment. That's the difference between the two conjunctions. And interestingly, this corresponds to a long tradition going uh, since uh, Grice's uh, first work on conventional applicatures, which states that coordinating conjunctions in general also introduce conventional applicatures and not asserted meanings. So with uh, coordinating conjunctions, we find the same kind of behavior we just saw for this German then. So for example, who came but he was ill? Uh, you cannot have this but clause in the scope of, of the question. You can, but you can do this. So who was it? Uh, who came but he was ill? Uh, is not a possible uh, uh, construction. And uh, similarly, in answer to a question, if a question is, when did you come? A felicitous answer is, I came when you called me, but it is not very felicitous, I think, to say, when did you come? You called me and I came. Because the meaning, with the temporal meaning, which is implied by and, is, cannot be in the focus of a question, it cannot be in, 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 in narrow focus or in assertion. A similar idea has been proposed by uh, Delors and Danlo and then earlier by group Lambda L for French uh, uh, the causal conjunction car. So French also has two conjunctions, parce que and car. One of them is more coordinating and one of them is more subordinating. Car is more like, parce que is more like because and car is more like maybe English for. And they show that just like then in German, car cannot be in the scope of various semantic operators such as negation. So 57, les années pas contente, car car uh, is impossible, so you cannot uh, say Lisa is not happy because she got an AMF, but because the sun is shining, you cannot uh, put the uh, causal meaning within the scope of negation with car, but you can do this with parce And similarly, within the scope of an uh, epistemic operator like b maybe, you can put the causal meaning implied by car, this coordinating causal meaning, but you cannot to do the same thing with because, with parce so the idea is that a car is a discourse level conjunction which introduces rhetorical relations rather than uh, asserted predications. And again, this finds its uh, correspondence in work on uh, the semantics of coordination. So in Churuku 2003, it has been argued that and also introduces rhetorical relations rather than assertions on the temporal order or causality between the two clauses. Okay, let's skip this. So uh, the solution that the Lauren Dunlop propose is cast in the framework of uh, segmented discourse of presentation theory of Escher and Lascarides. So uh, here on the slide you see the structure they proposed for the sentence Lisa uh, is pleased uh, because she got an A in maths uh, with the conjunction parce que, the subordinating conjunction and uh, the idea is that there is just one speech act which is P0, then we have one DRS which contains two facts and these facts are linked by a subordinating relation which is part of the same speech act. Whereas for car, we have two separate speech acts, which are act by a discourse level uh, rhetorical relation explanation, which expa uh, rhetorical relations, unlike normal predicates, cannot be negated. You cannot negate something which is used to build the structure of the discourse, which explains the scopelessness of car. So maybe aesthetic because is just like what uh, people have described for German and French, but this is not the case. So 60 shows that this uh, con construction uh, to the coordinating course can be freely used as an answer to a question. So 60 is an example from the Ascetic National Corpus. Why do you want to go to work at the theater? And the answer is because I cannot live without the stage. And here because is to that end, the construction which we have just been uh, discussing. Another criterion which shows that they are not scopeless is uh, the test which has been proposed for Russian in Pekulis 2008, uh, which is a construction which, uh, cleft-like construction where uh, Preposing a demonstrative pronoun before the subordinate clause is possible, but not before the coordinate clause. So 61, modern philography has become banal, luscious, and uninteresting, and all of this because it imagines itself to be art. This is possible with subordination in Russian, but a similarly built construction is impossible for coordination. So you cannot say in Russian, Masha was occupied by preparation to her exams, but and she had a code this, and we didn't take her with us. So you cannot focus this uh, end uh, relation. 
and for aesthetic, aesthetic does have the same construction and uh, it gives the same results uh, so uh, canonical subordination you can uh, use it uh, that was why he didn't yet see Hamirza so here uh, the conjunct the demonstrative uh, that is preposed to the subordinate clause and the meaning is the focalization of the while uh, relation that was only while he didn't yet see Hamirza and 64 has uh, shows that it is not possible with coordination so you cannot say you were late this and I haven't learned your lesson this is not uh, possible at least not an aesthetic and causal pseudo coordination uh, turns out to be subordinating according to this criterion, so it, it is perfectly possible to say something like 65, uh, this is because Terry sacrificed all his life and creation for the sake of his people. So here, the demonstrative that is preposed to the women amma, to, this, to that end, to the causal construction. So there is no independent reason to assume that the causal construction is semantically coordinating, unless we just define semantic coordination we are using a limited set of tests. But in this case, the use of the term semantic to uh, describe these relations seems to be rather circular. So we first introduce a set of tests, say that they are semantic, then we look at the construction, uh, look at this test, say it's semantic, but if it doesn't correlate neither with the meaning of this construction nor with other criteria which are semantic proper and of which we know independently that they are semantic. So if we don't want to abandon the multi-level approach, we need to assume that there are three levels and three sets of tests corresponding to them. One of them is uh, for linear order, the syntax, that's what Kulikov and Jekindov originally proposed. The second level is for the scope of semantic operators, such as negation and epistemic uh, modality and so on, which is not, has not been uh, discussed in previous prior work, but which can be safely assumed to be semantic. And finally, the level which has been discussed by Kulikov and Jekindov and U.S. and Sadek for the coordinate structure constraints, the distribution of mood features, constraints on the anaphora and so on, somehow, sort of, we don't know where to put it. It's some sort of third level which uh, we don't know what can it can be and what might that be. And I think that a good answer will be from the architecture of lexical functional grammar, a theory which most of you probably know about, which assumes exactly three, uh, at least three <laughs> levels uh, for the representation of syntax and semantics. So syntax in this theory is split into constituent structure and functional structure. Constituent structure encodes uh, C structure, encodes purely hierarchical uh, and uh, linear information about uh, words in the sentence, illustrated on the left uh, via normal constituent structure three, tree, whereas uh, the F structure, functional structure, encodes grammatical dependencies, grammatical relations, and uh, it is on F structure that things like a constraints on anaphora, uh, distribution of features, the coordinate structure constraint, and so on, are, uh, the constraints on extraction are, uh, are uh, formulated. In particular, coordination LFG is described in the following way. So you have at C structure a symmetrical construction where you have uh, one category like in this case IP in the above, then you have two children who are also IPs and a conjunction between them. And at the level of F structure you have a set of two F structures. So Alan has seen Sanslan and Rasul has seen Ali. We have a set of two mm, predications, Alan has seen Sanslan and Rasul has seen Ali. And importantly, F structure, even though it's quite close to semantics, and originally in early work in analogy, it was sort of uh, people tried to do work in uh, to do semantics in F structure. It is not semantics, and there is a separate level for semantics that is uh, not a pure level, but a deductive system which allows us. We, so the syntax supplies us premises for glue proofs for semantic uh, derivations, and then semantic derivations are constructed according to the rules of the lambda calculus. And importantly, the resulting, uh, so there is a separate level where we have two conditional meanings of the sentence, which is distinct from, uh, from F structure. So in this case, we have formula of the first order uh, logic, but we can have also other kinds of semantic representations uh, insofar as they're compositional, insofar as they can be formulated using the lambda calculus, for example, DRT. So this is not crucial. What's crucial is that the semantic level is a separate level. And this level is more or less the same as people assume and work on Compositional formal semantics. So, but so as I have shown here, uh, LFG has this uh, view of coordination and subordination. But the modular modular architecture of LFG means that we can define actually uh, this concept separately for each level. So we don't have to assume that, for example, C structure is like this, and it must correspond to a set. It can also uh, structural this can also correspond to a uh, subordinating F structure, and conversely, a uh, coordinating F structure can correspond to a more subordination like C structure. So we can provide separate definition for each level. At C structure, we can say that the distinction between parataxis and hypertaxis, that is, there is a, uh, for coordination, we have uh, 
the same mm, category label above uh, in the mother node and the same category labels in the children node, possibly with the exception of conjunctions, whereas in subordination the category information is only inherited from one of the ch ch child nodes. And this is similar to what Joas and Sedek have in their paper, so coordinate constituent is one of two or more sister nodes whose category information percolates to the mother node, and in the subordination it only percolates from one of the s children nodes. Uh, so in, on F structure we can define the difference as a relation between uh, some f structure occupying grammatical function of another f structure, like in, on the left, or the two f structures being uh, members of the same set. And on the semantic level, we can uh, adopt, for example, the uh, discourse definition uh, which I just proposed. So, uh, for subordination, we have one speech act and some sort of a semantic relation between the two facts or propositions or events or whatever kind of abstract point or objects you like. Or on the uh, for coordination, we have a discourse rhetorical relation between two speech acts. And the syntactic tests in Kudikov and Jekyllendorf and U.S. and Sadek belong to C-structure. And most of the semantic tests belong to F-structure. So in analogy terms, what they call semantics is not semantic, it's F-structure. It is the relational level of syntax, which explains why we have a causal construction with uh, such coordinating properties, which they would call semantic. And how this is not a pure stipulation, but this is in fact uh, a quite uncontroversial in LG literature. So across the board's extraction and the scope of mood features are explained in LG in the same way. It is the consequence of the rules of feature resolution uh, of sets. So if you apply a feature to a set, and if its feature is distributive, it has to be this, have the same value for each of the conjuncts. Therefore, you cannot extract uh, anything from just one of the conjuncts, because in this case there will be different values for the different conjuncts. And you cannot, if you assign a mood feature to a set, Similarly, it has to distribute over all of the conjuncts of this set. And the coordinate structure constraint is a bit more complicated, but generally also it is explained by the same uh, rule. And the only properly semantic tests are tests on the scope of uh, external operators, focusability, negation, questioning of the linking relation. What I have just illustrated by data from uh, Ossetic and uh, other languages. And in this approach, Ossetic constructions will, fall, uh, will cluster in the following way. So the complement the coordination will be coordinating and C-structure and subordinating and both F-structure and semantic. Whereas the causal construction will be coordinating and C-structure too, but coordinating and F-structure. Whereas semantics will also be subordinating just like with uh, complementation. And this illustrates the analysis. So for C-structure we assume for the causal construction uh, a, 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 a symmetrical structure like shown on the slide. And the same structure we assume for the complement construction, so the complement clauses in syntax in C structure terms merely coordinated with the main clause, I think, and you've cheated me, they're simply the same level. But on F structure for the causal construction, we assume that they're members of the set. So I came because you called me, there's just a set of two situations, you, I came and you called me. Then in the first clause, there is an adjunct that is this pronoun which refers to the second clause uh, and which encodes the causal relation. Whereas for, for complement clauses, we just have a mm, normal complementation F structure, which uh, corresponds to F uh, subordination. And on the semantic level, uh, for both constructions, we have quite uncontroversial uh, subordination, meaning that they are just relations within uh, one speech act. And importantly, what I would like to stress is that is the difference between this approach and the approach that is, uh, for example, this co subordination approach and the other approaches which are based on tests. Here, we do not uh, assume the tests are the primitives of our analysis. The primitives on our, our analysis are abstract structures which the theory supplies us with, the framework. Then we formulate hypothesis based on these uh, structures which we have available and then we see what in this particular language can follow from this, what it predicts in this particular language. And the tests that we use in each language can be quite different from each other. This is not, uh, this is not a bug but a feature, as uh, programmists say. So uh, here, the, um, uh, in fact, it means that uh, we have to devise separate tests for each of the language and the fact that the, the same tests do not apply in the same way in all languages is not, does not in any way falsify this idea. So for example, for aesthetic, most of the tests that are used here are not something which is uh, usually used, but something which is just uh, came up in, for a particular language based on the fact how these things should behave given the, uh, the formal framework. So that's a completely s different thing uh, to saying that we have just a set of tests, let's apply it across languages and see whether they cluster or they don't. Here we don't necessarily have to have the same tests apply. And to illustrate somehow that this approach is not ad hoc, but also can uh, provide insights uh, in other mm, consensus in other language, I would like to focus on a second case study uh, shortly. Of 
при, uh, also causal conjunctions in Russian, mm, which are потому что, так как, and поскольку. So they can be roughly translated as because, uh, for, or as, and since, but this is also rough labels for their translation. And uh, the first thing that immediately comes up when we look at them is that only потому что, and так как, allow epistemic uses like he's probably not sleeping because there's light in his window. So here, uh, the because clause does not mark the cause of the main clause in the logical sense. It marks the fact that we influence, infer the main clause from mm, the meaning of the subordinate clause. And here, as far as my intuition is concerned, only taka and padamushta can be used in such uh, cases. And as far as f-structure is concerned, according to, to the tests which can be uh, related to f-structure, all of these three constructions are uh, subordinating. So. Uh, all of them do not accrue, uh, allow across the board extraction, for example, in 67. What did Peter throw away because uh, Vasya broke? This is not possible for either of the three conjunctions. And similarly, gapping is also not possible for any of them. So the Republicans have received the majority of seats because the Democrats, the minority. This is not uh, possible with any of the conjunctions. Uh, but semantically, they do not align as neatly. So, for example, takak seems to be scopeless. It cannot be in the uh, scope of this uh, demonstrative that construction is going to be focused. So you cannot say as the asphalt is wet, but this as it has been raining. This is not possible with takak. So asphalt mokli, no, takak dosh pasho is impossible, but this is possible with patamushta. Uh, modern framework has become banal, luscious, and uninteresting, and all this because it considers itself art. An example which we already had above. And also it is possible with paskolku. So. It was very funny for me, but this is since I know many of those about whom the story is concerned. So here we have Eto Pascolku. This is possible, at least according to corpus data, and my intuition confirms this too. Uh, so yeah, let's keep this. Uh, but so this means that at least on a uh, semantic side, we have to say that Takak is coordinating, while the two other conjunctions are subordinating. But this does not at all correlate with C structure, because both Takak and Pascolku one of them is coordinating and the other is subordinating, can be embedded in the main clause, like in 73 and 74 show, and can be preposed. So you can say Vasya came for Peter called him, Tak Kak Peter Pazal Vasya on pre-show, you can prepose the subordinate clause, you can embed it, Vasya, Tak Kak Peter Pazal pre-show, Vasya because Peter called him came, uh, and 74, you can also do the same thing with Paskorku. But it has been long been remarked in literature in Russian that you cannot do the same things with Patamushta even though it's a more widespread and apparently more subordinating <laughs> in the semantic sense uh, conjunction. So 75A shows that preposing of Patamushta clauses is decidedly weird. So Patamushta Peter Pazalvasio on pre-show, maybe only in a parenthetical uh, context, whereas center embedding is totally out. So Vasya, Patamushta Peter Pazal pre-show is ungrammatical. So in this approach, which I'm proposing here, we have a um, little of C structure. Uh, on level of F structure, we have consistent subordination. On level of semantics, we have takak, which is coordinating, while the other conjunctions are subordinating. Patamushta has some discourse uses which can be classified as coordination, which I didn't uh, stop on, but you can see it in, the, in one of the slides in the handout. And as far as C structure is concerned, it does not in any way correlate with the F structure and the semantics. And we can um, just sort of uh, say that Patamushto is always coordinating, regardless of its meaning, whereas Takak and Paskorku are subordinating, even though Takak is semantically coordinating. So it shows us, at least for Russian, this approach proves fruitful and allows us to, uh, at least it doesn't, uh, the Russian data confirms that the tests fall into three categories. They can be mismatching, but they can be, in general, tests which are, belong to one level match with each other. So this, at least for static and Russian, this proves useful. And I think that this uh, generally has to be uh, investigated more further in this approach with three levels. And LFG allows us to do this in a very straightforward way. But of course, this sounds like this joke from Spank Graham. So if someone says 28 is very likely universal constraint, it means that uh, I know for sure that it works for English, French, and certain lot of Burmese dialects. So I've made a similar claim here. So b basically, it knows for English and Russian, therefore, sorry, for Russian and aesthetic, therefore, it's sort of uh, universal. It should work everywhere. Of course, I don't know this. but. At the very least, it looks like a promising direction, and currently it explains more data than the other approaches, and I hope that it can, in the future, work for other languages and explain the data too. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Lots, lots of exciting data and ideas. Um, I'm curious, I'm not quite sure whether I can say that right, but I'm curious, uh, uh, curious about cases where it looks like you have a, a, a correlation between the features and the linear order, which you wouldn't expect if you dissociate them too much. And mm -hmm. there's two cases I'm thinking of. One is um, you had similar examples like with partial agreement with NP coordination. Mm. So where if you have John and Mary came, you typically get full plural agreement if the conjoint of people is uh -huh. But in many languages, mm. you get partial agreement if the conjoint of people follows. So there came John and Mary, if you like, like in, in the classic Ben Mamoun cases in Arabic, mm -hmm. you get partial agreement, but with the first conjoint. Mm -hmm. There's, there's an exception, but typically across the board, it will be linear order based, but the, but the reflex will be feature based. Mm -hmm. And the, the second example is right note raising, where if you have, you know, in English it works best with negative polarity. I, I, I washed but then didn't dry any of the dishes, mm -hmm. and the NPI is licensed by the second conjunct. Mm -hmm. So if you turn I was watching, uh, yes, I didn't dry it. Mm -hmm. I didn't wash, but then I dried all the dishes, mm -hmm. you don't get the NPI. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, my preferred example mm -hmm. for German ones where it's case. So mm. if you see, I saw, um, I saw, and I saw, but then didn't help the girl on the road. Mm -hmm. Then the girl on the road will be dative because uh, helping okay. has lexically one to dative mm -hmm. object. Whereas if you, I helped but didn't see, you know, that mm -hmm. it will be accusative because C has accusative. So it's in both cases what you mm -hmm. have is there's a particular feature like in the case or mm -hmm. the agreement which mm -hmm. looks like F structure, I guess. But then, but then the determination of that is clearly linked to, mm -hmm. to the linear order to the C structure. And I always mm -hmm. wondered, you know, I always thought that LFG would find that troublesome because of that dissociation, but maybe that's... Yeah, thank you, that's an interesting question. And in fact, this unbalanced coordination, there's a lot of uh, literature on it, and it's generally a problem for LFG, but there's been a proposed analysis of it uh, by uh, Rachel Nodling and Louisa Sadler, I think. And what they propose is that um, you have a mapping, so you have an, a, a flat structure, a C structure, and then you have a set at F structure, but the set is ordered according to the linear precedence of the conjuncts according to, uh, in relation to each other. So there's a relation called F precedence, which maps F structures to C structures, and all of the nodes which correspond to this F structure in C structure have to precede the nodes that correspond to another F structure. Uh -huh. So they, and based on this feature, they define edge features. So they define features which only are taken from the leftmost or the rightmost conjunct. And in this way, they resolve this problem of, uh, of single conjunct agreement. And of course, possibly also the case assignment features can be resolved in the same way. Although, of course, so this, and the important thing is that these features are all features of normal coordinating constructions. They're not features of some sort of mismatching things. Though. So it seems that these features should be f uh, thought of as basic to how LFG handles sets and uh, C structure in general and not uh, these kind of more complicated mismatch things. But at least that's the, the current proposals are based on F precedence and they seem to work generally for... But so uh, that means that, mm -hmm. that the F structure somehow mimics the yeah. C structure. Yes, yes. So it's, there's no, just you can't just yeah. draw a very clear line between the two. And there are other cases like this. For example, a, a junction, at, if you just look at C structure, you can not always delineate a junction from coordination. If you adjoin an IP to another IP, you have IP above, two IPs below, you just can't yeah. say whether it's coordination or subordination based on C structure alone. So that's kind of you, that's an idealization, in a, in, as it were. But it allows us sort of, we first have to separate the things, look at what we can do separately, and then maybe look at possible correlations on no correlations. So, uh, so that's an, Nice way to do it, I think. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. You talked about causality and causal constructions. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you apply your diagnostics to periphrastic causal constructions, which are multi causal. So I got my son to watch the car, go to market, buy some very pretty mm -hmm. so we have a string, a recursive string with the embedded clause. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that figure in, 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 in the formula? Periphrastic mm -hmm. causal. I mean, cause just like I made, I had, uh, I made the sun wash the car. Yeah. Well, I didn't look at causatives. Uh, it's not the case that I, I made. For example, can the, the I mean, 
they, they classify the uh, main, main flaws with the cause mm -hmm. and then embedded subordinate flaws. Mm -hmm. That was something how. I think it would be uh, semantics, at least subordination of one event to another sub-event, maybe the causation event and the main event, because you would, I think the scope of semantic operators can only fall, maybe he made the sun wash the car, for example, if maybe it can scope over wash, not about made, uh, or something like this. I mean, I, I can't say for sure now, but I think the, the scope of the semantic operators would be only on the main predicate, on the causation event. And so this would be subordinating on the semantic side. Yeah, thank you. Uh, cause it causative more. Thank you. I've just got a general pattern linguistic question, mm -hmm. not really linguistic. Probably related to your last, last comment. Uh, you are sort of presenting this stuff to the typology crowd. I mean, to the, uh, to the typologists. <laughs> the reason I'm asking is that what you're saying here it seems to be very much against the traditional typology. However, it seems to be very much in alignment with uh, so-called canonical typology, mm. which is kind of a very popular, well, not very popular, but... Here in the UK it is. <laughs> <laughs> sort of gained popularity from certain people. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's, you, can, you can sort of develop mm -hmm. this into a very interesting Pictures of mm. canonical typology. I'm just wondering how many. Uh, how yeah, that's a good. The data from other languages. Not yet so much because there's not much data that I mean. This, has to, this requires very detailed analysis of I language data. Yeah, language. well, I do obviously. But I also sort of encouraging everyone to <laughs> to try to apply the same thing to languages and try to look whether it works because it's uh, you have to really look and because before formulating this, uh, you can't just apply a battery of tests. You have to look first how language works in general. That's the problem. But I, yes, this, this is of course in total disagreement with traditional typology, yeah, for sure. In fact, Martin Haspenmark, we discussed this with him, he's not very <laughs> optimistic. He <laughs> so he liked the general direction of thinking, but because these are not comparative concepts according to this. Yeah, oh, this very restricted definition of the term, of course. Yeah, it's a dative pronoun in the dative form and the conjunction and. Mm -hmm. And the dative pronoun sort of categorically refers to the second clause. It can, uh, so it's like because of that, uh, uh, sorry, um, how can I? Yeah, so you have an element, a phenomenal element in the main clause, in the semantic the main clause, which semantically refers to the second clause. And uh, the conjunction stands between them, but this dative element can go into the focus position, focusing. Uh, and you can replace this dative by a postposition phrase because of that, for example. So it can clearly be seen that it's this that is has its antecedents the whole second situation. What is it's, it's sort of like the correlatives, which I just uh, illustrated a bit at the beginning. But it's the second, the order is reversed. So you first have the main clause; it contains a demonstrative, and then it categorically refers to the second clause. Not so. What? Do you, do you have a composition analysis of that? In, in the Journal of Linguistics paper, I do. So I sort of, I, I just, uh, the construction imposes, uh, so essentially what it does is that and in the causal construction in my analysis, uh, just I didn't give it here because it's this glue semantic thing, but uh, and only contributes the conjunction of the two situations. And the dative form is uh, enforced, uh, so the construction enforce, enforces the dative to be there and sets uh, the, its antecedent syntactically to be the second clause. And also, it assigns to it the dative meaning. So it's composition in the sense that it's uh, derived in the uh, in the group semantics, but it's, it's it's associated with the construction, not with the with the dative itself. Because the dative itself, on its own, generally does not mark cause in aesthetic. It's construction specific here. You see, the reason yeah. I'm asking is in part because of additive focus marking. Mm -hmm. Because in many languages, you have additive focus markers which are end end. Mm -hmm. Kind of for a pronoun. Uh -huh. So, but in English comes that also as two. So John, you know, John two went to the cinema. Mm -hmm. Often comes that as John and he uh -huh. went to the cinema, and it, it, so the he agrees with the John, but in mm -hmm. terms of binding, it doesn't work out. And, mm -hmm. and so that's another thing where it's not clear what what the different parts do. So maybe construction analysis actually would also work. For mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I think so. How, how do you do? You have additive focus marking in wherever you are. Additive, you mean? Oh, so it's just a, a particle? No, no, no. Oh, no yeah. Ah, that's a shame. It's, it's very simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, acetic has correlatives. I have looked at them generally. Uh, I just defined a dissertation on correlatives in acetic. So, uh, in general, correlatives are, are subordinating because they in this language. So, uh, they can be. But there is an interesting construction which uh, can turn a normal correlative into a pseudo correlating construction. So, you can sort of a construction like uh, John, uh, whom saw, so he is my friend, can be turned into John saw him and. Uh, sorry. Uh, he, he is my friend and John who saw. So you can post pose the subordinate clause, place ends between them, and use the subordinator in the second clause. So you can sort of turn any subordinating construction into this kind of pseudo coordination, a similar kind of thing. I haven't yet explored them in much detail, but I'm just pointing out that in aesthetic, apparently also relativization, certain kinds of relativization behaves in a similar way. And also temporal clauses, because any correlative, uh, they have the same structure. So you can say something like, I then came and when you called me, meaning I came when you called me. So y you have some pseudo coordinating relativization. Even though the normal correlatives, they are subordinating because they can be embedded, they have no, uh, they don't fall into the scope of various operators, they do not have to have the same mood and so on, but they can be sort of lifted up to main clause status. What would be your prediction about relative clauses which are not correlated, not for aesthetic, but in general? Well, it depends on the type of correlative clauses. I would say mostly subordinating. Would you expect to find it in this Yes, I would. I mean, certainly I would. But especially since you often have probably, you, you, for example, correlatives are a good example because they often develop from paradoxics, and you would expect to have semantic or F structure subordination and syntactic C structure coordination, for example. I would expect that a lot. And also, I would expect probably, uh, yeah with correlatives and possibly also with uh, things which develop from adverbial clauses. Like uh, non-restrictive correlatives often correspond, uh, relative clauses often correspond to convertible con constructions, I think. Like when you, well, I, it's, it's not clear whether you can classify them as non-restrictive clauses, maybe the languages just don't have non-restrictive relative, but you could expect that such things eventually develop into, into normal relative clauses. And in this case, you would also expect some sort of, I think uh, these effects are due to grammaticalization effect. I think it's simply because sort of the syntax, the F structure evolves before, and first you have the semantic shift to, to the code subordinating, then you have F structure shift to subordinating structure, and then C structure sort of sometimes lags behind, like, like here. So the F structure has already become, uh, for the complement construction, subordinating, but the C structure is still flat. So we can expect that at some point it will also become subordinating, maybe. Um, I'm afraid I don't have examples ready at hand. Uh, Maybe on online in the, in the corpus, but uh, it would, yeah. What, what was the subordinating? I can write on the on the board if right. you like. What's the subordinator in the, in the relative clause? Uh, in, interrogative based subordinator. Right. Interrogative based. They are derived from the, so clause. relative clause, uh, relative elements. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you get the demonstrative? It's most in the main clause. It's a resumptive. So you have something like, uh, and I just like this. John, whom saw, he is my friend. That's the normal way of forming uh, relative clauses in the language. So the one who John saw is my friend. But technically, it's John whom saw, he is my friend. And you can have an internal head. You can say, John, which boy saw? He is my friend, which means the boy who John saw is my friend. And so the, the subordinate is always a WH word? Sorry? The subordinate. It's whom? Yeah, but in your case, it's always a WH. Yeah, a WH. You can't get a demonstrative. demonstrative no, no, only here. So this he is a demonstrative. Nice. And you sort of have a um, division of labor. So he marks the position in the main clause, and whom is internal, and marks the position of the relative. Pro uh, so this can be redone into he's my friend and Jun Holmes whom so. Something like that. Can, can that element to the, uh, uh, the anaphoric application do anything else in the language? Can it be used? Uh, it's a normal anaphoric. It's demo distal demonstrative. And it's used also just for, for as a pronominal. Is it used after verbs of communication? You said that. No. no okay. For communication, you would use either also a correlative or you would use. Uh, this uh, convert construction saying you, you use like Turkic and uh, other uh, 
languages of North Eurasia, I think it's everywhere. So you say, I will come saying, he said, meaning he said that he will come.